Let's set the tone for this place. Sing it with me. Sing your love. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Welcome the Lord. Sing higher than the mountains. Higher than the mountains that I face. Stronger than the power of the grave. Constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains. One thing. One thing remains. Sing higher. Higher than the mountains that I fear. Stronger than the power of the grave. Constant in the trial and the change. One thing. Remains one thing, this one thing remains. Your love, your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Come on, your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me.
our hands together. shirts this morning and I had an excuse to wear it. That's right. Come on. It's pretty great. And I love a good t-shirt, so I'm very happy about this morning. I just want to welcome everyone this morning. All of our first and second time guests, take a minute and in the pew in front of you, there's a guest information sheet. Take a few seconds for us, fill it out. At the end of the service, you can take it back to our welcome booth in the foyer and we are going to have a little gift for you. I want to make a shout out to these guys. These guys were through D-Now we can call The Gathering. Did you guys have fun? Yeah? 
got to be there a little bit, and it was just so fun seeing. I want you guys to know, I, I get to see a little bit of Wednesday nights, what's going on over there, and seeing what's happening in the student ministry here at Central Baptist, and there are great things happening. There are kids and students and young men and women growing for the sake of the kingdom and reaching out for the kingdom. So we should be encouraged. We should put our hands together right now for these guys because they are working hard for the kingdom of God. Yeah, guys, we're going to tune up for just a second. Once you go, find someone new this morning. Find someone familiar to you. Shake some hands this morning. Uh, you can head back to your seats this time. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, but just a second. Our student pastor, our youth pastor here, Joel Byers, is going to bring a word to us. And you may be seated. One, two, one, two. Check. Check one, two. There we go. Uh, I know that you've already been welcomed by Peyton, but uh, we, if you are a guest here, I just want to introduce myself. I am Joel Byers. I'm, I, I'm blessed to be the student pastor here at Central Baptist Church, and we have a great, great group of teenagers, as Pat, Peyton already said. Uh, but if you have a student, 7th grade through 12th grade, and you're visiting today, we want them over at Radiate Student Ministries. We'd love to meet them. And we'd love to have them be a part of us. But this weekend, it was the today's the culmination of a, an amazing, amazing weekend we call it The Gathering. And uh, it's a D-Now style weekend where this year we wanted to do something a little different. And uh, usually you bring in uh, a, a speaker and you bring in the band and you bring in all, uh, for this big weekend. And I just started praying about what God would have us to do differently and, and what would have a lasting impact on our students here. And, and I started praying about three people out of our church uh, that God would use this weekend to speak into our students' lives. And uh, God could not have laid three better people in my heart. It doesn't mean that they're the only three people in this church that could have done this weekend. But these three people, Keith Libran, Robert Templin, and Joy Cravens, did a phenomenal job of just really uh, just bringing God's word and challenging our students uh, this, this weekend uh, with, to be the, the disciples that they're called to be, and to be the, and the disciples make disciples, and that we're to share our faith. And um, I just want to give you, a, this is our giving opportunity. That's what we call it here at Central Baptist Church. And, and uh, you, we, we've worshiped God through worship and, we, and through singing, and we worship God through God's word, but we also worship him through giving. And this weekend would not have been possible without you guys giving of your tithes and offerings to the church. And so we want to, we just want you to have this giving opportunity uh, to, to be able to give towards things like this. Uh, and that's what this money goes towards. And, and I'm telling you, there's lasting fruit from this weekend because you invested in Radio Student Ministries. And just to show you that and prove to you that, I have Murphy Wisenhunt, who's one of our students. He's a junior at White House High School. And she's going to come up and to share a brief testimony of what God did in her life this weekend uh, to kind of give you guys a glimpse of our weekend. Yeah. Hello. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, well, uh, this before this weekend, I was just struggling about uh, being um, fine about where I am in my relationship with the Lord and just where I am in life. And uh, this weekend, they talked a lot about... Uh, being disciples and everything, and then I, uh, the first night I sat down with my girls, and I was just like, and I don't really like opening up to people, which <laughs> this is pretty big, so uh, I don't like opening up to people, and that was the first time ever that I've actually said something to a group of people that something I have struggled with, and it was being just still in my relationship with the Lord, and in the relationship with other people, and uh, so uh, I opened up to them about that, and I was like, okay, I feel so much better now. Like, a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. I've just said something I'm struggling with, and now they're there to help me and uh, encourage me to be better. And then uh, Mr. Robert Templin, um, uh, he was there all weekend, and none of us but one person said hi to him or anything. And so I was like, wow, that breaks my heart because I love getting to meet new people and uh, – and I had so, seen him, and some other people had seen him, but we didn't go up and talk to him um, like we normally would. And uh, he was like, we're so content with our own circles and our own places and where we sit and where we do. And, uh, and he's like, there's people out there who need disciples like y'all to go talk to them so you can make more disciples. And it just broke my heart. And I'm like, that is where I am. I'm content. I don't want to be content. I want to be able to go up to whoever and just be like, yeah, you know Jesus? Yeah, he's my savior. And you look like you're struggling with something. I'm here. I can help you if you need it. And uh, I wanted to uh, 
be able to go do that in my schools and everything, but even more in my own home. And something really great, um, I texted my mom last night. She asked how I was doing, how this weekend was going. I was like, yeah, mom, it's just been so amazing. God is so good. And she didn't respond. I was like, yeah, because she probably feels really awkward that I said that. Well, um, this morning, actually, when we were there, my phone goes off, and then she texted me and said, yeah, baby, he is. That, um, that uh, she just agreed with me, and so that was a lot. That uh, <laughs> It was really exciting. So uh, thank you all for um, being uh, disciples to me and uh, everyone in this church. Y'all are so great. This is the first church I've ever actually been a part of, and... I'm so thankful that I was led to this church to be my first church, and um, this weekend just been so great, and thank you all for giving um, so that we could have this weekend and make it possible, but it's just been so great and such a blessing, and yeah. You know, as a, a picture of discipleship and someone pouring into their life, uh, Hayden Wisenhunt is, is her sister, and at camp we had a moment where I said, Murphy's life was changed by Christ because Hayden, because God became real to Hayden, and she went and modeled that to her sister. And so that's what discipleship is. It's living out our lives among the people that, we're, that God puts in our path every single day and, and truly just living out and modeling what it means to be a Christ follower. And so that's what these teenagers are pumped about, and I'm hoping that our adults are there with them to just keep mentoring them and keep encouraging them and keep loving them and just keep just praising them and going saying hey let's go let's do this let's win our city let's win our schools let's win our communities let's pray this morning and and i just pray that you would uh, take this opportunity to uh give this morning uh towards uh the finances of the church God, we just pray that you just uh we thank you and we just give you all the glory for such an amazing amazing weekend god we thank you that uh you provide through people through your people in the church and God, it's without your people's giving of their tithes and offerings, God, that, that we couldn't do the things that we get to do. And so, God, we just we are so grateful that you've blessed the people of Central Baptist Church to be able to give the way they give so that we can do the things that we do. God, we pray, pray and ask all this in your mighty name. Amen.
going to sing that out. You guys stand. We're going to sing, yes, the blood. It is, it is my victory. Just sing this with me. Yes, the blood, it is my I just want to calm things down for a second. I just want to hear you lead this. I know you know it. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it out of his throne. Yes, he did, amen. Lord, now indeed, Lord, now indeed I find my God and I alone, come on, can change the leper's heart and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I and stain he washed it white as snow you washed us Lord you cleansed us all when when before the throne I stand in this time my soul to see my lips shall still be deep. Can you sing that? You lead it. Cause Jesus made it all. Let's sing it again. Sing Jesus. Come on. He washed it white as snow. He washed. He washed it white as snow. One more time. He washed it white as snow. Come on, this is the cry of our hearts. Everything you have. Oh, praise. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life.
Come on, let's fill the room. Oh, praise. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the Come on. Oh, he's our Savior. Pay my debt. You are Lord Jesus. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up. Just your voices. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the One more time. Oh, Amen. Let's put our hands together, right? We praise our Jesus. He's so good. The blood of Jesus washes me. Amen. Each and every one of us. You've come into this room and his grace is for you. He is a good God, full of love. It says, scripture clearly states that our God is love. And that is our Savior, that is our Lord, that is the King of the universe who's so mighty, yet filled with compassion. He's slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. So, oh, praise the one who paid our debts and raised our lives up from the grave. I want you to bow your heads to me for just a moment to worship our Lord in prayer and going to the Word. Lord Jesus, we thank you. God, as we come to you, God, we can speak to you often. As we come to you right now, Lord, we sincerely thank you for your glory. We thank you for your love. And God, most of all, now we thank you for your forgiveness through the sacrifice on the cross. We thank you, God, that you're working in our young people's lives, that you're touching them, Lord, that you're building up the kingdom. And God, we thank you for what we can call the pillars, God, the people who've just been so faithful through the years, that we can all come together as one body and worship one God together, young and old. We thank you for the church. We thank you for your institution. And God, help us to grow to further your kingdom. We want to change the world, nothing less. So we give you glory. We thank you for the ability to worship you, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness and for your blood. And we'll praise you for all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. Why well, a great worship today. I enjoyed singing with you. I tell you, every Sunday I come and just excited about getting to worship and see what God's going to do today. If you have a Bible, if you turn it to 1 Chronicles chapter number 4, and while you're turning there, 1 Chronicles 4, I want to introduce a friend of ours and one of our missionaries. Our church has the privilege of being involved in helping support some 100 missionaries on about 70, 90 fields. I don't know, I can remember how many different fields around the world. And one of the great missions programs we help support is called Water for Life. And the missionary in charge of that is Mark Reynolds. And Mark is a, a good friend. Come on up, Brother Mark. Mark is a good friend and a talented minister, experienced minister. And he is taking... Uh, on a new challenge in his life. He's going to take some of us to Honduras in July of this year so that we can help dig water well and hold vacation Bible schools and share the gospel. And I wanted him to just come and, and tell you a little bit about the trip. Some of you might be on the edge of whether or not to go, and hopefully Mark can help sway you to decide to go. Would you give Mark Reynolds a warm welcome as he just tells you about our trip coming up? Well, what a joy it is to be at Central Baptist Church. I love your church. I love the spirit here. I love the worship. And I have a, a great admiration and respect for Pastor Ken. You've got a great pastor, amen? He is one of the good ones. And I don't have to say that. I really mean that. Uh, every time I hear Pastor Ken preach, I always get something fresh. You know, I've been around preachers a long time. I am a preacher. You know, and you hear messages, they're good. But Pastor Kim has a different perspective on it, and I'm, I'm not just up here stroking him. I'm just really telling you the truth. You are blessed to have a man of God, anointed man like, like Pastor Kim in Barbara. Well, what we've got is world-changing. 
And as I listen to the story about Hayden and Murphy, wow, what a powerful illustration of what God's love really is. When God's love gets a hold of us, and it begins to fill our love tank. I mentioned this in Sunday school. This, he fills our love tank, and that love begins to overflow in the lives of others. And Hayden allowed the love of God to flow into her sister's life. And it's changed her life. Guess what, Murphy? You're going to be spilling over in the lives of others as well. That's what world changing is. It's not difficult. It's not hard to understand. It's just being involved with God and letting him be truly God in our lives. And so we surrender. There's power and humility. And we simply surrender and say, God, I want to do what you want me to do for the rest of my life. It gets real simple. God shows you. And so in my 60s, <laughs> after 40 years of ministering uh, in the pastorate, God has called us to start a water ministry, which shocked me. Uh, he always surprises us when we're least looking, right? We've started this water ministry in the past 18 months. We've been, we've been in operation for two years. In the past 18 months, which is lightning fast, we have had the opportunity of, of, uh, pr of providing water for 17 communities in Honduras. 70 people have accepted Christ on those trips. Boys, girls, teenagers, men and women, parents. It's phenomenal to see the life change that takes place. World changing is simply being obedient to God here in, in Tyler and across the world. I think the difference in a place like Honduras, it's very dark there spiritually. It's very dark. But where the darkness is, the light shines the brightest, amen? When you go as a North American to a Central American country and work with people who are living in a dark world that many times we don't even understand, that light is so bright. People are hungering for the truth. They want to know, how do I get out of this hopeless, helpless situation? And we can tell them it's by the blood of Jesus Amen. that paid our debt Amen. and raised this life up from the dead. Praise God. What does it take to go on a mission trip? Desire. A passion to do what God's passionate about. When we become passionate about what God is passionate about, all the doors open. You may be here this morning. I've talked to several and said, oh, I'm not sure I can afford this trip. Believe me, if you make the commitment to go and you ask God, he'll provide the resources. Amen. I absolutely believe that. Amen. No doubt about it. He's the God of resources. And by the way, when, he, when, you are, when you are attempting to fulfill the plan of the Great Commission, he has all the resources in the universe. You may not know where they're coming from. Let me give an illustration. We, when we uh, were looking for drill bits, I was in a, in a Bible study downtown Houston, and this was the upper level executives in downtown Houston, bankers, lawyers, doctors and such. So we're in our suits, and we're walking around, and we're trading cards and talking about what we do. And this man from National Oil of Varco walked up. He is, National Oil of Varco is a huge supplier for the oil and gas industry. And about a minute after we started talking, he said, do you need drill bits? And I said, yes, absolutely. He said, I think I can get you a half a dozen. I said, that's great. He emailed later on that afternoon and said, I just checked our inventory, asked for 20. They sent us 22 drill bits at a cost of over $200,000. And he just walked up and said, do you need this? I can't tell you all the donations from people who would, I would never have dreamed just walked up and said, what do you need? And this is, well, I can help you with that. And so consequently, in this short amount of time, we have a complete new drill unit sitting in West Texas, a, a truck-mounted uh, drilling rig, an 18-wheeler to haul it down on, all the tools, all the supplies, everything that we need to get started. The only thing we need is to get it in the country tariff-free. God has provided exceedingly abundantly above all that we've asked or think. He will do that for you as well. Let me encourage you, pray about this. And if you have an inclination to go, that's probably the spirit of God saying, do this. And then give it to God, start fundraising, do your part and just see what God will do. We're gonna go down guys and get muddy and dirty and sweaty and greasy, work hard and see lives change for eternity. Amen. Let's go down, amen. Amen, amen. thank you, thank you.
I was with him up to that last part, of dirt, dirty, sweaty, and greasy. There's a role for administrative gifts, right? <laughs> Supervisory gifts, right? Because <laughs> that's kind of where, you know, God. Anyway. Oh, I hope you go. Where's Jody? I was seeing Jody. Where's Jody? Where are you, Jody? Jody is helping us head this trip up on our end of it, and she has information sheets. You got down too quick. Stand back up. And if you were looking for, it's going to be hard to pick her out with all these blue shirts, but she will, she has an information sheet to tell you all about the trip. Please um, see her if you're interested in going. And if you can't go and you just want to, and your heart is in it, help scholarship some of these young uh, families that want to go. Because I tell you, life trip, life change, missions, uh, change you forever when you make a mission trip. And so we want you to do that. Let's uh, take a look at the scripture this morning. I want to continue a theme called Game Changers. And my idea when God laid this on my heart at the first of the year was there are certain ideas, behaviors, thoughts that if you embrace them will completely change your life. And as we start this new year, we're already, can you believe we're already halfway through February? We're into February. Uh, Game changing ideas. And we've talked about different ones. And the one I want to challenge you about this morning is thinking big, thinking God. You know, you can't think God effectively and accurately unless you think big. But we do tend to think small when we think of God, and that's what I want to challenge you. And there's this great little, just a tiny portion of Scripture in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. It's really a genealogy where they're just listing some of these people of the nation of Israel, but there's a phrase about one man that stands out, and it says this about him. In verse 9, it actually says, Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called him Jabez, saying, because I have uh, bare him with sorrow. His name literally means sorrowful. Just a great point here, and we don't have time, is you don't have to, you're not stuck with what you were born with. Uh, I don't know what you named your kid. Don't name him sorrowful. Uh, Anyway, it's, he becomes one of the great men of the Bible, as you see in the next verse. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and thou wouldst keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. That was a big prayer with some major components. And we'll come back to them in a moment. But the point or our study is, God granted him that which he requested. A little background. Of this honorable man, we know nothing other than what is mentioned here. His name appears nowhere else in Scripture, except it does find in First Chronicles chapter 2, but it appears to be the name of a place there. But this is the one time this man is mentioned. But he's mentioned as a man of faith, a man of vision, a man who gets things from God. And as I challenge you about the year coming and game-changing thoughts, I want to challenge you about thinking big. What if you took the lid off of your dreams this year? What if you started thinking about what God wants to do in your life instead of spending your time listing your limitations? What if you just said, yes, Lord, instead of arguing against His call on your life? What if you didn't start with your resource list when contemplating a task, but started with God's unlimited power. What if you started thinking big and started thinking God? It would change your life. You would be transformed. The problem is, for so many of us, we dream too small. We need a mind-blowing vision. Great example of that, you know the story of David and Goliath. David is just a little shepherd boy. He's too young to go fight in the war. There is a war going on between Israel and Philistia. But he is old enough to take some supplies to his brothers. He gets to the camp with supplies and he finds the nation of Israel, God's army, God's people, with a history of God's deliverance, cowering in fear because on the other side of the valley there's a nine-foot-tall giant that's challenging Israel to send them a champion out to fight with him. And not a single person in Israel is willing to go. Not a single proven warrior, not a single battle-hardened veteran, all these Men of God, all these people that know God, not one will go fight, including King Saul, who should have been the first to go, because the Bible said about Saul, he stood a head and shoulders above every other man in the crowd. He was the closest in height to Goliath among his people, and he wasn't going. They were all cowering in fear, and David heard Goliath 
hurling abuse on the nation of Israel, hurling abuse on the name of God. And he said, this is not right. And he volunteered. He went up, little shepherd boy volunteered and said, hey, this guy wants somebody to come fight? I'm up. Sign me up. I'll take it on. And they said, you're too young. And he said, Don't, listen, God has shown himself mighty in my life. He delivered me from a bear. He delivered me from a lion. And he will deliver, and I love it, this godless Philistine into me. And I'm going to take his head today. And people will know that Israel's God, Israel's God is a great and powerful God. And you know the story. David in his slingshot takes down the giant. And it starts him on his continued path to greatness in Israel. But the point is, he had a God-sized Vision, a mind-blowing vision. He wasn't cowering in fear. Jabez has a mind-blowing, God-sized vision. Oh, that thou would bless me indeed. Enlarge my coast, that thine hand might be with me. That was keep me from evil, and that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. We need to think big. We need to think God. Why don't you say that with me? Just think big, think God. Say it with me. Think big, think God. One more time. Think big, think God. Look at Jabez's request. Let's break it down. Four requests. Number one, he says, bless me indeed. This is the first thing you've got to get past if you're going to have a god side vision. You've got to get comfortable with asking God for yourself. Somewhere in the history of tradition, in Christian tradition, someone has floated the idea or got it in our psyche that we can pray for other people, but we cannot pray for ourselves. And that's not a biblical idea. In fact, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts with, give us this day our daily bread. It is not wrong to pray for yourself. The first hurdle to get over is, if you're going to think big and think God, is you don't have to just only pray for missionaries. Only pray for pastors. Only pray for the sick. You can pray for yourself, but particularly if you're praying for the passion that God has given you. So the first thing is it's okay to ask God to bless you. Bless me indeed. Number two, he says, enlarge my coast. I'm not satisfied with where I am. Oh, that in blessing you would bless me with children. Enlarge my borders with disciples, and that my hand may be with me in business. Thou mayest make me like unto my companions. That's from the Hebrew translation of the Septuagint. Here we have the scripture coming out and he's saying, enlarge my coast. Make everything I'm involved in bigger. Make everything you've let me have a part in grow. Do more in my life, O God. Increase my success. Enlarge my impact. Strengthen my influence and stretch. Remember that? Stretch my dreams. Some of you, oh, I want to challenge you. You need a bigger vision. You need to be like Jabez and say, enlarge my coast. You know, all these other guys that are listed here, they just, Lord, God bless me. No, he says, enlarge my coast. We can do more. We can be more. We can accomplish more. And then he says, third, keep your hand on me. He knows that if he's going to accomplish this, it's going to take God. With God, we can do anything. Amen? In the positive, uh, we have verses which say, I can do all things Through Christ who strengtheneth me. So when we're asking God that he would bless us, we're asking God to keep his hand on us, it's because with him all things are possible. It's possible. You know, if God is on my side, I don't have to worry about anything. Amen? I immediately thought of two. I don't really have this time, but I thought of two stories about bears being chased by bears. You know, probably my favorite story about these bears is these two old guys are out in the wilderness and this huge grizzly shows up. And he starts toward him, and he looks very dangerous, and he starts charging. And one of the guys stops, t- is t- taking off his boots, and is putting on his tennis shoes. And the guy said, what are you doing? He said, I'm putting my tennis shoes. He said, I've got to run fast. He said, don't you know that that grizzly can run almost 40 miles an hour? There's no way you can outrun the grizzly. And he said, I don't have to outrun the grizzly. I just have to outrun you. I love that story. Don't you just love that? I had nothing to do with it, but I just couldn't resist. But the other story I have is of, is of a preacher who's out, traveling circuit preacher, and a bear gets after him, and he begins to pray. And he says, Lord, if you can't help me, please, Lord, don't help that bear. Amen? So I'm talking positive and negative here. We, we say, first of all, I can do all things with Christ with strength in me. We can do it. We can outrun a bear if God helps us. Or negative, here's the negative, for without him... You can do nothing. You want to spend some fruitful time this evening, spend it in John 15. 
as Jesus talks about being the vine and the branch. He's the vine and we're the branches. But he gets down to saying this, for without me, you can do nothing. We need to remember that with God's hand on us, all things are possible. But when God's hand is not on us, nothing is possible. For without me, you can do nothing. Fourth thing, keep me from evil so that I don't grieve you, the Hebrew says, so that I don't grieve you, that it may not rule over me, that evil, wicked thoughts may the less grieve me. That's a prayer any believer of God can pray, can't we? Keep me from evil. Oh, what's so, there's an old hymn we used to sing that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the one I love. Don't you hate that part of our nature? We're just, we're just prone to evil. It's in our flaws of nature, and we need the hand of God. But Jabez says, look, I need you to enlarge my coast. I need you to bless me indeed. I need your hand on me, and I need you to keep me from evil because, Lord, I know you can't bless evil. But you can keep me from evil, and therefore you can bless me. And the key for our text today is, God granted his request. This passage shows us God's heart for blessing his people. I like what Mark said. It's not about how it's going to happen. It's just does God want you to do it. If God lays it on your heart, it'll happen. If God has said, this is what I want you to do, he has the power to make it happen. So we need to think big, think God. Say it with me. Think big. Where does big thinking come from? It comes from refusing to accept the belief system that was handed down to us. That's the number one thing. Refuse to accept the belief system about these issues of how small God is that's handed down. Some of you, your parents did the best they could, but bless their hearts, they were struggling, and they laid a bunch of junk on you. They told you about weak stories about God. They told you to just hang on, just get by. If you can just make it, you'll be okay. You need to get rid of all that stuff. Refuse to accept the belief system that was handed down to you if it's not furthering you in your walk with God. Secondly, you got to get fed up with taking with what is left over. you got to get tired of getting the leftovers in life. Amen? Boy, I was born in the wrong age group. You know, when I was a kid, um, we would have a big family get-together, and they would have all the parents that sit at one table and the kids at the other table, and they would let the parents eat first. You remember that? And then we kids get to eat. And I've dreamed all my life growing up being an adult so I could eat first. And what do we do? We switch the whole thing around. Now we feed the little rugrats first, and then you get what's left over. But I used to, I tell you, the only good thing came out of it was I developed a love for chicken neck, fried chicken neck. You know why I developed a love for fried chicken neck? Because that was all that was left after they picked over that carcass of that chicken. Hey, I got tired of chicken neck. I get tired. We need to get tired of having the leftovers in us. You ought to get sick and tired of life of getting by. Sick and tired of of other people prospering, not you. Sick and tired of your children being lost. Sick and tired of your class not growing. Sick and tired of your friends not knowing Christ. Sick and tired of missionaries not having enough money. You ought to get sick and tired of having to live on what's left over. You've got to develop a God-sized vision. Hey, our God is big. Think big. He's, got, he's big. Think big. See God. Don't see the problem. See God. David didn't see a giant. He saw God. Goliath was a big dude, that's for sure. But not compared to Almighty God. He wasn't looking at Goliath. He was looking at God. And number four, remember that we have a big God. See what can be, not just what is. I love that. You know, really great people who get things from God and and do things for God and and succeed in their life, they come to situations, they don't say, that's impossible. Or if they're in a meeting, they'll hear somebody say, well, you know, we'd like to do that, that's impossible. But you know what the great ones do? They say, well, you know, okay, okay, that's impossible. But let's just talk about, what if it were possible? How would we approach it? Try doing that this week. It'll shift your thinking to a different place. What if it were possible? Okay, so it's a, but what if it were possible? What would we do? Now, you think of your life right now. What's an impossible situation? What's one that's got you ready to give up? Emotionally, financially, educationally, spiritually, and you're just ready. No, what if it were possible? What would we do? You see, we focus too small when we focus on something other than God. Let me say this. We focus too small when we focus on the culture instead of focusing on God. 
I've got a little burr under my saddle as a preacher. I fear that the bad news of the world, the wickedness in the world, the bad news of the world is calling the church away from the good news of the gospel. I want to ask you, why is the church so fixated on the problems and the actions of this wicked culture instead of being fixated on the person and the work of Jesus Christ? I think we give way too much attention to what's going on around us. And we get way too caught up in ways of controlling what's around us instead of focusing on the greatness and the majesty and the power of Jesus Christ. You see, as a preacher... I don't want to talk about same-sex marriage, abortion, or Kim Kardashian's backside. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about the one who, when I was 12 years old, I was introduced to for the first time, and he rocked my world. He changed my life. He took me from being a lost sinner with no hope in my life and turned me into a saint of God with an eternal hope of heaven. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about the one who can free our hearts from the kind of personal obsessions that lead to the cultural problems we're facing. You see, the only thing that will ever really change any culture, including ours, is the transformed hearts of people who've been born again. Rules, do what you can. Government has its place. Thank God for some kind of system. But I'm going to tell you, rules will never change the heart of a people. You need God to step into broken man and woman's life and transform their heart, and that transforms their desires, and that changes how they live and what they do. There was a man in the Bible who was demon-possessed. And he cut himself with stones and he refused to wear clothes and ran around naked. And he lived in the tombs and he cried out day and day, night and day. And everybody was afraid of him. And Jesus came into his territory one day and Jesus transformed him. He cast the demons out of this man. And the scripture says that all the town turned out because they could see this, this, this powerful wrecked Humanity sitting clothed and in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. They wanted to know what happened to him. And it was Jesus. You see, it was Jesus who changed the demon-possessed man, not more stringent rules about nudity in Israel. It was Jesus who turned the tax crook Zacchaeus into an honest man, not a better accounting system. It was Jesus and his compassion that turned the adulterous woman into someone who sinned no more not, a more, not more bureaucratic restrictions on who could or could not get married in Israel. Now, I'm not saying those things are not important, but I'm saying they're not nearly as important as getting focused on the person of Jesus Christ. We get too, we, we get, we need a big, think big. We need to think about God. We need to tell people about God, not about these rules. I'll give you just a couple of phrases from the scripture. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. That's what Jesus said. Woman taken in sin said, Come see a man that told me all that ever I did. And I love the phrase of the people who came seeking Jesus and they said to the disciples, Sirs, we would see Jesus. I think there's some people here today that would like to see Jesus. So let's not get so caught up in the culture that we stop focusing on God. And we dream too small when we leave God out of our plan. I want to challenge you. If you can accomplish your goal, whatever it is in whatever area, without God, you're thinking too small. Boy, that's been riding on me the last year. If I, I hate, because I am surrounded by talented, gifted people with all kinds of resources, and it doesn't take me long to start running down my list of a comp, you know, of, uh, of resources and saying, okay, I can plug this in here and plug this in here and somebody has a problem, oh, I can make this happen over here. But when I heard this thought, if you can accomplish your goal without God, you're thinking too small, boy, it got a hold of me. And I said, man, I'm thinking too small. I'm looking at what Central Baptist can do instead of what God can do. A couple of key thoughts and I'll bring this to a close. Number one, how can God get the glory in your challenge if people or a, could do what you need to do on their own ability. In other words, how can God get the glory if man can do it on his own? Everybody here knows the story of the nation of Israel escaping Pharaoh's army 
passing through the Red Sea, God parting the Red Sea, and then drowning Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Now let me ask you, if Israel had escaped Pharaoh's army by a combination of, of a forced night march and slick distraction, would we still be talking about them today? No. We talk about them because God went and showed up. Because God, God can't get the glory if man can do it on his own ability. And if you're solving your problem just through your own ability, and I'm not saying you don't have responsibility, and I'm not saying you don't have to do what you have to do, but I'm saying if you're only limiting, if you're limiting your problem to what only you can do, how's God going to get any glory out of that? Think big, think God. Number two, how will we learn faith if we can plan our way out of trouble? How will we learn faith if we can plan our way out of trouble? I love what what uh, Mark was challenging you about, because as a pastor, we know these things. Uh, we learned them a long time ago. People would come and say, I think God's calling me to do it, but I just don't see any way to do it, so I guess I won't do it. I said, no. If God's called you to do it, sign up. If God's called you to go to Bible college, make your reservation. If God, make sure you know God called you. But if God has called you, don't worry about not knowing how you're going to get it done. Just be worrying about being obedient and getting it done. I challenge you all the time about issues as small as financial issues and challenge you, you ought to do this. And you say, I don't know how I can do it. That doesn't mean you don't do it. You just say, God, as you provide, I'm going to step in. But the point is, if, how will you ever learn faith if you can plan your way out of trouble? And number three, how will you impress the world if they can find the same success you're having in their organization? How can Central Baptist Church impress the world if other organizations that don't know God are just as effective as we are? We need some things that we can point our fingers out and say, God did that. There is no other explanation but that God did that. That's what I love about preaching the gospel and preaching the word of God because so many times we stand up and preach and somebody will come and get saved and their life will be transformed. Some of you I'm looking at today, you know, uh, You've been made new people in Christ. Your life's been transformed. And we don't know how that happened other than that God did it. God did it in your life. And people look at you and, and they say, what's going on? And they say, hey, I just tell you, I met God. We're going to have a series of sermons coming up called Share Your Story. And I, it looks like Bill, <laughs> I'm talking to Bill because we're working on this. It looks like God's taking it in a whole other direction what I intended, but... But as I started talking about this, people started to share their stories. They started coming up and let me tell you my story. Let me tell you my story. And I'm going to tell you, there's some powerful stories of what God has done. And you know what? That's the way it's supposed to be. In Exodus 33, it says in verse 16, how Moses is arguing with God. And he says, how will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Amen. Even Moses, you know, reminding God, it's the fact that we're God's people and God is with us that brings us credibility. So we need to think big. We need to thank God. Think big. Think big. So many things can change so quick. If you just get out of the rut of your thinking, if you quit if you expand the borders and enlarge your coast, trust that God wants to do a new thing, a big thing. Now, I'll talk about a new thing next week. I'm, already, I'm ready to preach that now. Y'all got time for another one? Okay, don't get nervous. I'm done. But think big. Think big. What would you do? What would you do? What would you attempt for God if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you do? What would you do? Let's stand to our feet. It's our tradition to close our service with a time of response. We call it an invitation because we invite people to come and make a decision. Perhaps you're here today, and as I've talked about Christ transforming the lives of people and bringing people into a relationship with Him, you're saying, boy, I need that. I need Jesus in my life. I've never had that real relationship with Christ, and I want to meet Jesus today. Well, then come. When we begin to sing, Peyton will sing, and then when he begins singing, I want to invite you to come and take me by the hand. I'll have one of our workers show you from the Scripture how to meet Jesus.
Maybe you want to come and join the church today. Maybe you've listened and experienced this church in the last several weeks and you said, this is the place. This is where we belong. This is where God's at work. We want to line up here. And this is our place where we'll talk to you about that. Maybe you have some need in your life, some burden, and you want someone to pray for you. We will do that. Or maybe you just want to pray by yourself. See, we built this altar, built it long so that people could kneel and pray here and invite you to come and do that. But we're going to let people respond as God leads them. We'll sing a verse, and if God spoke to your heart, I want you to come on the very first verse as we sing and do what God has challenged you to do. Some of you need to come and say, enlarge my coast, God. Get my vision up. Let me quit seeing it so small. Give me a big dream. Give me a big vision. Let me do something by faith. You be the first to come. Heavenly Father, fill your altar with people doing business with you today. Save the lost. Add to your church. Enlarge our coast. Increase our vision. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As they begin to sing, the altars are open. Won't you come right now? Come on. In. Hi, my name's Kim Beckham. I'm the pastor of Central Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this worship service. I hope you found the message helpful and the worship inspiring. If you don't have a church home, please come check us out on a Sunday soon. If you should have any question about today's message or just want to talk about spiritual things in general, please check us out on our website and email us or call us at Central Baptist Church, 903-561-6361. So glad you are a part of the worship today. Come see us soon. God bless you.